I am honored to be here with Mr. Moses Pendleton in part because as a 19-year-old, <laughs> Momix came and visited my school and showed me a new kind of dance and something that I had never seen before and opened the road for me to pursue a, a career in the field. So I want to say thank you for your inventiveness over the last uh, 40 to 50 years. Yes, well, it was a, a mildly successful escape from what I probably should have been doing, but <laughs> it's, a, it's the plight of the artist. Thank you, though. I'm, I'm glad to be here, and I like the projection that, oh, in coffee, too. My goodness. We didn't even like a sip. Now, here we are. Oh, yes. Oops. Now I'm all falling apart here. Ugh. Moses, I had a chance. I, I, I have some, in my age, you need a more stable chair to feel comfortable. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, you're going to see I'll some works later, um, not with chairs, but with a table, at least, some skirts, some amazing apparatuses. Um, I had the luxury of seeing the 2 p.m. performance. I won't give anything away. But the journey that you've created with this Viva Momix uh, takes us through through years of choreography and then some new inventions. Can you just um, yeah. share with well, us what uh, you're uh, going uh, for? It's Viva Momix. It used to be called Super Momix, Momix in orbit, uh, more, more, more mix, more mix, uh, this kind of thing. But it's basically our, our uh, compilation album, if you allow me to use a musical term. It's uh, uh, highlights from various uh, full evening productions that we've done over the last 40 years. So you see a real cross section of the aesthetic of Momix. Uh, with this show, I think. Uh, some things are new uh, a year ago and some almost 40 years old. Uh, we didn't put dates on them, but uh, next time. It's an idea, actually. Uh, but that's what the show is, and it does uh, 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 try to show uh, the aesthetic of Momix as well. A part of it is, uh, a major part of it is the dynamic of the show, somewhat different from a modern dance uh, show in that it's more a kind of surreal vaudeville uh, uh, and a tempo that if you don't like what you're seeing, you don't have to wait long before it changes. And uh, so it does have that kind of humor. It doesn't really tell a story, but kind of uh, plays with the, the imaginary world. Uh, you know, the fantasy is an integral part of the company's reality. And uh, we uh, spend a lot of time working on you know, the, the untrue, or let's say the, uh, it's, not a, it's not fake news or fake art, but it's, uh, it's of the imagination, uh, which I, I guess is real enough. Uh, but, uh, and then we, you know, as you were saying, we, I see the company uh, is a, in the word mix. It's a really a mix of, of dance and acrobatics and uh, circus ideas and theater of illusion. It could be a, a visual, physical theater. We, we use, uh, uh, you know, we, we start out, I almost think of myself more in the world of sculpture and painting where I'm looking for a picture. Uh, we, uh, we, are fascinated with to see how the human form mixes and, and matches and connects to the non-human, the plant and the animal and the mineral. And you'll see that reflected, the inspiration being kind of coming from the natural world, a uh, supernatural world, if you will. Uh, uh, the unconscious is always a, a stream wor wor worthy of taking a dip in, as long as you uh, can stop. Yes? In you terms know, of that, distinction between human and non-human. Yes. We see the anthropomorphic, and then we see, I don't know how to describe what the opposite of it is, where you have humans becoming non-humans, becoming yes. creatures, to make becoming a, natural forms. The, there's, a, there's a human in a leaf and a leaf in the human. That's, uh, that's something Picasso would see. That's something uh, that probably is part of our reality, uh, really to understand uh, the connection, not just to you know, your human uh, fellow man, but your fellow tree and your fellow rock. And especially, I must confess that uh, in this last two years, it's been quite a, a, an adventure into the COVID cave to explore uh, those connections uh, that you may not have had time with because you were busy going out to dinner with friends and socializing and needing human contact or traveling even. So a lot of travel in your own backyard with, uh, you know, for in my case, there's a there's a beautiful ash tree that I'm kind of carving my initials in uh, as of late. And, uh, and I do a lot of photography, which is very related to the, uh, the act of choreography, I think. You know, or, or if you're a visualist, that's, it helps train the eye and work in terms of framing and, uh, and, and causing uh, 
something uh, that might uh, uh, force you to find music to actually see the picture. I, I work synesthetically, you know, this uh, term where there's some, there was a school of painting that would, they would paint only when they, when they could hear Eric Satie playing or Chopin or something that would, inf uh, that would uh, influence the brain so that the hand would paint the picture. So it's, uh, I use music a lot in, in the, or, uh, I, you don't mind my just rambling about, about the process, but I, but I think it's, uh, you know, it's all about uh, breaking down barriers in your brain and uh, whatever you've learned, how can you unlearn it or how can you escape uh, into a kind of daydream that you're conscious of enough or at least someone's videotaping those uh, physical uh, exchanges that you're doing. Uh, re reacting to music rather than trying to make dances or anything. I, I do a lot of uh, every rehearsal that we have when we're, especially when we're working on a new thing, is that we set up uh, an environment to uh, to break it, all those barriers down and and, and have fun like a uh, child's play. Uh, but you need that kind of energy. You know, Bill Buckley once said that the trouble with the conservative party is it lacks a bit of enthusiasm. You know. <laughs> And, uh, and so, I, if anything, I'm not really a director or choreographer, but I, I don't, do know how to, I think, to make uh, the space uh, 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 more enthusiastic for uh, creativity. Uh, you need to uh, play, be willing to play that game, have fun, and, and so it's a learning process for sure, that technique. But it's uh, basically working with the bodies uh, and seeing, you know, how they, uh, uh, you know, how they are relating to something beyond the body, beyond the human. Uh, that's part of our humanity, I would say. My gosh, I'm enjoying this uh, slow motion organic <laughs> tree. I, I couldn't have said that without that visual uh, stimulus. Really strange. Okay. I'd like to say we programmed it specifically for this talk, but we didn't. Well, I, I can see you just follow the, follow the seasons and you'll be, you'll be well, well connected. So you mentioned play. It feels like your work emerges from play. Yeah, well, Shakespeare wrote plays. He didn't write works. That's, that's for sure. No connection there. But also, the counterpoint is rigor. And I feel like in the inventiveness we see in your work, there, it's, it might be play, but it's rigorous play, in, in, in my oh, view. Oh, yes. You and have to be in shape uh, to play. You know, you know it's just, this is true. And you have to, the brain is another muscle that you need to exercise, just like your calf muscles and your thighs. <laughs> it's, you need to find some way to, uh, uh, to keep the dendrites from rusting. And uh, so you challenge yourself, you know, and it, it, a lot of it for me is it's, uh, it's already there. I take a kind of a natural process of trying to, as I say, be a, a, a catalyst for uh, play and choreography and then, and then see myself more as an editor, selector. You know, it's kind of a, <laughs> I, I hate making these uh, analogies, but you know how Michelangelo would go up into the hills and the mountains of Carrera. And uh, it, it was stated that it, he, he would go around and he would uh, smell uh, the marble and to, to, to determine what should be revealed uh, that would excite him, him and hopefully his audience. <laughs> that he, he would f feel the bear or the nude inside a block of marble by, by a scent, you know, <laughs> quite something. Uh, but, you know, we've lost our sense of smell, and I, I, I've sometimes uh, burn incense and uh, spray various aromatics and herbs to try to get everyone in the right, in the right uh, uh, mind uh, to play or, or to imagine, you know. And, and again, there's, uh, uh, it, and the, the, there's also the discipline. You have to know how to play, train to play, and then have the discipline to go back and review and edit what you've done, which also should be a kind of play. So, you know, as much as I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm basically a positive person that way, I, I take a very, you know, positive approach to some of the horrors that are going on, uh, that go on in, in a psychodrama of a, of a dance rehearsal. Uh, and I wanted to just connect it a bit with Dartmouth because that whole uh, education was something that I did when I kind of escaped from Dartmouth out to the West Coast to uh, enroll in the, uh, I don't know if any of you know this, it's called Mid-Peninsula Free University. It's out right near Stanford. My girlfriend at the time went to uh, summer school there, so I had a chance to uh, drive her across country and take these very special uh, uh, psychodrama uh, classes, marathon encounters, 72 hours where you would 
have a group of 30 people uh, just be with each other without sleep. And what came out of that was just astonishing. And, and you got to explore uh, things that you never thought humanly possible within putting under yourself under this duress. Coming back from that, that summer class, uh, I was always going uh, around to all my fellow students, wanting to hug them and, and to encounter them. You know, they, they use this word, let's encounter. Not saying, hi, I'd like to meet you. To, you would you like to go out on the green and encounter? <laughs> I was full of that, you know, and uh, before all of that attitude uh, w wore off, Allison Chase uh, wanted me to get uh, a group of three or four guys uh, at Webster Hall uh, to make our first dance. Uh, uh, and uh, it was uh, an idea that there, there was a, uh, it was a, it was one of the Dartmouth, uh, very few black students. He was, his name was Danny Brown. He was an incredible rollerblader, but he didn't seem to fit in. And she thought, you know, we, I would be someone to get him to come with Jonathan Mulkin and Steve Johnson and myself and go in at, at night and work on a dance. Uh, but, uh, but collectively, you see, this was uh, the mindset back in uh, the times of uh, when I was at Dartmouth, doing, uh, writing p papers collectively, doing, uh, thinking, uh, think tanks, where it was uh, something everyone was interested in. And this was the same for the arts, too. We were doing collective art. We would, uh, you know, choreography by committee. Uh, but that all came from, for me, it came from out, uh, at the, the Free University. And uh, it's interesting how we, we came and applied that, and it created Palobolus, uh, ultimately, which was this dance collective coming, coming in that time. So this idea of a collective and a collaborative environment that you're creating together, that's persisted from the seeds of your work as a dance artist. I would love to know, what is that, how does that translate to what you're looking for in a dancer today? Well, there are two things. <clears throat> you can all hear us, right? Oh, good. Oh, good. Uh, there is a, if you're looking for a dancer to make a new show, you might look for a dancer that could show you something. And uh, maybe if it's really uh, astonishing, if you free them up, maybe that they would be, you know, uh, contribute to the new work. But that's one situation. Another situation is if you have existing choreography with all the very physical uh, and, and whatever requirements it's, uh, that are required of the new dancer, you would look for someone to handle that prop or, or be, be able to do that move. That's, that's another thing as well. <clears throat> we have several projects that I've done with ballet companies, uh, Paris Opera Ballet and uh, Frankfurt, uh, or uh, the Ballet Nancy, various Joffrey. And, and I remember the directors would say, well, Moses, uh, we have a few people in the company that are more inclined to be creative. Maybe uh, you could start and work with them, and that's kind of how it is. Um, you kind of audition them once they get in the company. You continuously audition them for roles specific to uh, your, what it, you might be imagining or what we need to do uh, to fill you know, contracts for bookings, so forth. I'm glad you mentioned objects, because you have some incredibly designed objects throughout your work, up until the, the new work today. I would love to hear how you introduce an object into the <laughs> choreographic space. Duck. Duck. <laughs> yeah, there's some, danger in, there's some danger involved, just to. Yeah, no. Now, we're talking about objects or props or accessories. Whatever it is, uh, the, the, we have what might be costumes or they might be props. They're both, really. They uh, change the look of the, the body. If you want to, there's a piece, I don't know if you've seen the show, some of you have, I think. But the piece called, uh, that's from a larger work called Botanica, and it's that marigold garden. And so how we initially started that piece, for example, we would first uh, say, let's, I grew you know, tens of thousands of marigolds in a giant sun just to be sort of like Monet, you know, having to uh, grow them in order to show them and then paint them ultimately. But that process of growing marigolds certainly got me thinking, you know, marigolds is a nice subject since I'm very aware of them in reality, tens of thousands of them, which is so, and, and the shape of a giant sun. That image was there when we decided to do something botanical. Uh, so, and I know Cynthia said, well, let's put a petticoat uh, uh, on the dancer and see if we could 
have female dancers in which we would do something, costume-wise, prop-wise, to turn them into flowers and see if we can get them to move through space and have uh, something that would be uh, the dance of the marigolds. But first, the first thing was to put the petticoats on, four of them, on top of each other to make that puffy marigold look, you know, paint them orange and uh, work uh, to get that to, to organize. And then, then we start playing around with how we can move uh, that picture of a, a marigold uh, through space. The, the nice thing about this costume prop was the ability to <laughs> start it out at, at neck level. So it, when you see them first, they're just little orange puff balls. And using this kind of hip tabla music, kind of sexy samba uh, feeling, uh, there is a metamorphosis in that five minute piece of, uh, and it's achieved by moving the dress slowly uh, uh, throughout the dance from the neck down uh, to the end where they become little marigold carpets that they fly off on. But there's a progression of the, the costume. It's like undressing all the way through five minutes. And as you undress, you reveal several different, completely different images of, uh, of a dancer and a marigold and, and what have you. It's quite uh, marvelous that way, the, the logic of metamorphosis through the manipulation of this costume uh, is quite, uh, it's a good example. Of, of what we're talking about, I think. That's a great, <laughs> it, that's a great example. And, yeah. and, and uh, the art of transformation, which you see so deeply yeah. in all of these works. Or the other, there, another piece, just to, another example would be, Cynthia and I are, were <clears throat> performing Momix out at Beaver Creek in the winter. And I was downhill skiing all, all day. And she would meet me for a glass of Moe at this little chic uh, stand out uh, you know, in front of the slopes. But to our right was a Christmas tree with those extraordinary pouring out of the lights that were just streaming down. And I remember sitting there thinking, there's a, there's a, a physical visual image that if, was, if you ch took it away from a Christmas tree and applied and hung those Christmas lights, those moving lights on bodies, uh, we would just start w there. And, uh, and uh, we created this piece that's called Light Rains. Uh, and it's really using uh, the light of that uh, Christmas uh, ornament uh, that streams up and down. And without using any other lighting, if you, if you use just the light from the prop uh, and manipulate it around your body, you change imagery quite, quite rapidly. And, and it's, uh, you know, it's quite a, uh, but that came by just being watching around you uh, as a choreographer. There's one thing can be just a dancer, but you're always looking for ideas. And you never know, as John Lennon would say, you never know when you're going to be attacked by one. And you better be prepared to get it down some capacity. Uh, and so there it was. And, and it, it's satisfying to see, think that apres ski and the right uh, glass of champagne, you know, that was the making of uh, a piece that we're performing around the world. That's, that's quite cool. Uh, but, there's every, but we have also, uh, sculptures, props, uh, things like, um, you know, the table piece. I think you saw the, it was a wonderful piece to massive attacks, very rock-like, but that piece was, came uh, from, uh, from doing an opera of Carmen with uh, the film director, Lena Werkmuller in uh, Munich. And it was the, uh, in Taverna, the Taverna uh, section. So we needed a table uh, to do this piece. And sometimes you, when you're working something for an opera and there were 20 people on the table, but you saw, some seed of, what if we made a smaller table and made it into a solo? You know, so it started in Munich with uh, Carmen. It ends up here at Dartmouth as table talk. Uh, and that's another thing too, where the prop itself is a table, but it's, uh, it's a beautiful ending. As uh, if, if you haven't seen it, you could, you could uh, if you can imagine that this dancer has this interaction with a, a prop, it's almost like a dance partner, which is a wooden table, which he, finally climbs under and you lower the light so he disappears and the table is moving, uh, he's moving underneath it, but twisting and dancing and, and it's talking and it's quite a, quite a fantastic ending. Uh, your dances are only really as powerful as how you end them. Uh, and that's, so we work on the endings first, first of all, and then kind of move backwards. You get a lot of beginnings and a lot of endings yes, in this right. journey, which is the, end is the, beginning, the bonus. Right. <laughs> And the, both of the works that you just referenced are in the second half of this evening's program. Yes, yes. Well, well, there's a, well, something from the first half. 
Uh, yeah, the, we, uh, I, I said the marigolds are in the first half. Uh, there's a piece uh, from a, a full evening work called Opus Cactus, which is all about the flora and the fauna and the, uh, and the vibe in the, in the Sonoran Desert. I mean, he did this, uh, premiered with the, the Ballet Arizona a while back. Uh, but this is a piece uh, uh, that's aboriginal uh, music, and it uses this very simple prop, which is a 10-foot pole with rubber stoppers. And what, what the pole allows you to do is, is to change your means of locomotion by using it almost like in a pole vaulting, kayaking way. It can create another sense of gravity. And uh, it's a powerful male piece, uh, warriors uh, uh, of, of some, some mythical tribe. Uh, but it's... Uh, highly uh, difficult and it, uh, it's full of suspension. I did a lot of, uh, I was like a stick dancer when I was, was dancing. I used to, you know, I did a solo called Momix, of all names, and it was done with a little stick that I used to kind of launch myself around and, as I say, change, uh, change gravity, hang time. Much of the dynamic we think of is really that, uh, not so much of live theater, but of uh, cinema. We use terms like stop action and Joe action, freeze frame, you know, slow mo, slower mo, slowest mo possible, this kind of thing. And to, to add cinematic dynamics sometimes can get you to uh, be involved. You know, the main thing is to keep an audience engaged, you know, no matter what. We have no rules whether or think it's art or dance or, or care that much as long as it's something that. Uh, does capture the, the attention and the energy of, of an audience. And it, first of all, you do it you know, in, in the audience of your own uh, peers and group. And, and then we've been fortunate, actually, to, to have it resonate somewhat outside of our own fantasies. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's talk about design with some of these objects. There's a craftsmanship of these objects that is then supplemented and augmented by the craftsmanship of the choreography. Or, yeah. Is this the sort of thing where you have an initial idea for a skirt, that, you know, or a, a puffy skirt that could become a marigold, or a pole that could allow people to well, fly across yes. stage, and then you talk to a designer, or do you bring it into the studio and say, what does the body need? Um, what's that re relationship like? We, uh, we've worked with, uh, uh, you know, kinetic sculptures, that, that piece called Teardrop, that's from Opus Cactus, a beautiful metal wheel-like sculpture that two people interact in. <clears throat> you know, it's named after this Indian native term of uh, dream catcher. It's a beautiful ending, too, where it's the, they, they inter interact and finally roll it over each other and back and forth. And, and, it, uh, and that was built by Alan Bodine, and he was a sculptor. And he would build, a, build it, and he would kind of depend on us to do something with it. So he would, he would just plop that in the studio. And then, I mean, that was a very challenging piece to figure out because it's so dangerous. And, and, and when you're first trying to figure it out, how much time, countless hours of and, uh, uh, hits and misses that you have to put up with. And I remember the first girl that was learning that uh, maneuver. She wore a football helmet just to, in practice because she would very likely get You'll crushed see why. by it. Yeah, that's... <laughs> but, um, but we do uh, other things. There was, uh, um, uh, I told you about the poles, and then there's a beautiful old piece. It's 30 years old uh, to music of Peter Gabriel and uh, Mercy Street, very sensual and beautiful uh, piece. But we just use three helium balloons that, uh, that create uh, the image and, uh, and in very nude female sensual forms. It's called spawning. And you know what spawning is where salmon you know, maneuver themselves upstream, lay their eggs, and expire. Life goes on to uh, Peter Gabriel music. And, and I think the, the other element, too, is the, is the sound, how, how it does influence what you see. And we often say, close your eyes, listen to the music, and see the dance. <laughs> There's some truth to that. And so that's, that seemed to work very well with those balloons. And, and also to the use of lighting. I spend a great deal of time looking at lighting, uh, many times things are overlit. Sometimes things, uh, f for some people, are underlit. But I, uh, I use it uh, more in a painterly kind of way where you're, do you're working with shadows. And sometimes, if you don't see something quite 
uh, you, you start to imagine what it might look like, and then, then maybe it reveals itself. There are, you know, we're known as a theater of illusions, uh, and we use a, just to jump into that other one that we use is black light, where you, you use a, the, the, shading, the term shading, where you uh, eliminate all parts of the body, combine those parts with other body parts, and then you have a, a composite body, a giant snow goose that you could never do without uh, basically costuming someone, uh, people, the ladies in black, except for their white arms. And so they can be moving their bodies all around that you don't see. You only see the arms. And that gives you a lot of potential to explore and organize in an interesting and creative way. And this one, you know, we call, it's a, an, another a section from a, a full evening work, which is probably our most visually far out piece. It's called uh, Lunacy, Sheer Lunacy. Uh, uh, and it's all done in black light. And th we did it uh, initially with a ballet aspen. Uh, and it was quite a, a shocker because we, we just have part of the body and toshus white and the other black. And so they, they were like these half bodies that moved about. And, and we had, it was one of the most physical, different, difficult pieces we've ever made. But the, the audience never saw the effort by mostly the men who were all in black lifting uh, the ladies around in magical ways, but you never saw them. And you, there was no visible means of support, uh, but it created this other world of gravity. So it really felt like we were watching a full evening ballet taking place on the moon, hence lunacy. Sheer lunacy, as I said. And there's some sections, Margaret, that we should bring back that I've been viewing. It's so beautiful, it's so crazy. Next time up here, we, we should have some more bits from other hits, and uh, I, I don't think you'll be disappointed. So, oh. yes, those uh, snaps and claps. For our next our latest uh, show is based on Alice in Wonderland. It's called Alice, of all, all titles, uh, and we struggled with that. But that's, that's been going for a couple of years, mostly in Europe, but it will start to be doing a US tour next, next year. And uh, hopefully, we can bring it to Dartmouth, because I'm sure uh, it w would be well received here. So talk it out to Mary Lou, she's around. Put a, put, put a little uh, idea in her ear if she's here. So you, oh dear. you've been talking about the curiosity about <laughs> pushing, pushing the human form, what bodies can do together. You've talked about nature as a source of inspiration. Oh, and just the body, yeah, the athleticism. You know, the, I, I, was, uh, I came to Dartmouth, really, uh, early decision, because my dream was to be on the national ski team. I came here because of Al Merrill. Any, anybody know Al, the Silver Fox? He, was, he witnessed me winning the Vermont State Champion uh, cross-country skiing at Putney against the best uh, cross-country skiers in the country at the time. And, uh, but anyway, I, I came here, and he was also very uh, uh, influential in my thinking, you know, he was uh, my ski coach, but he also talked about uh, the discipline and the energy and getting a second and third wind that you can apply even if you're studying calculus uh, or running up Mount Musalak. There was a connection between what the body uh, could do, what your brain could do to drive it, and what your body in great shape could do to drive your brain to think all these wonderful things. It's taking a very athletic approach to aesthetics. Uh, and my football, my ski coach, uh, uh, Al Merrill, for sure, was uh, an inspiration as much as James Melville Cox. You know, the, uh, the, I was an English major. I guess that's what you major in if you don't know what you're going to do. So you can just hope you read some interesting books and get out of here, and that kind of thing. That was what, what we did. But I was very fortunate, uh, even before Palabolus, before dance, even before the, the, the encounter groups in San Francisco, was having my freshman seminar in 102 in, the, in Sanborn with James Melville Cox. Do you, you know who he is, or was? I mean, he still is, in terms of his voice. But he was uh, you know, world authority on Hawthorne and Melville. But when, when you go into this seminar, He's asking everybody, Miss, Mr. Pendleton, wh where are you from? You know? And he really got the students to think about 
themselves, you know, their, your, own, uh, uh, your own thinking. You are unique. And, all, it was, and he would lace it with knowledge of Melville and Twain, but he, he personalized it and theatricalized teaching. Uh, that was, uh, and it, again, in the end, it's just that enthusiasm uh, for your subject that it can be contagious. And in a collective sense, you need to uh, inspire the troops to make the piece that's there, but you, you, you need their help. Uh, a, a great teachers really need attentive students to bring out their greatness. Anyway, I'm rambling a bit here, but the memory is beginning to speak. I must also say, I walked around campus, you know, uh, just to sense uh, the various buildings and doorknobs and things. And, and thought about all my professors, and I did encounter m several of them uh, in the form of park benches around. <laughs> that did shock me a bit. That has been my, my absolute shock to see Jim Epperson, you know, may he rest in peace. I sat there and had a, a bran muffin and thought about Jim, you know, well, my old English professor. Sounds like you might need to do a piece with a bench. Yeah, I sat on a lot of benches yesterday. <laughs> so. It it seems like a lot of your inspiration as a younger dance artist, but through today, comes from outside of looking at other choreographers. Yeah, um, that too. Oh, I, yeah, well, I wanted to say that, that uh, looking outside sometimes as a choreographer, you need to do that. You, you know uh, Rachel Carson, who wrote uh, Silent Spring. Her mother was very disappointed with her because she d didn't want to be a writer. She wanted to be an oceanographer, which she became. But there would never have been Silent Spring if she wasn't informed as a writer by oceanography. And so my background in, in raising dairy cows and skiing and in, in, uh, romantic poetry has everything to do with the decisions and the choices that you might make 30 years later, I think. And, and so you, know, uh, uh, you must take in those influences. Uh, I, I grow a lot of uh, plants, uh, and I, I like the natural world. Ice, uh, icy swim. I do a, an hour of swimming in a, in a cold uh, mountain pond every day, you know, just to polish up the third eye and get ready, you know, to write in the notebook. You know, this is a, is that physical life is really something that is very reflective in, in the company that we keep with Momix and earlier with Palabalus. And very reflective of Vermont and New Hampshire. Yes. Yeah, I was born and raised in uh, Northeast Kingdom. So coming down south to Hanover, you know, I felt a little guilty about leaving the Northeast Kingdom. You know, and now we live in Connecticut. You, know, you can imagine how it is down there. It's soft. Every, supposedly when you go into warmer climates, it's softer down there, right? You know, but still, but the Northeast Kingdom, which is a, a very independent section of Vermont, which all, never wanted to be part of any union, uh, so it was very independent-minded up there. And before we did Palabolus, when we were still at Dartmouth students, I, I must add this, is that the other formative company was called the Vermont Natural Theater. And in the summer, Jonathan Wolken and I and, and several uh, bands of runaway young people from Texas that just came and lived on the commune, we, we created a theater in which, you know, I incorporated 50 head of Melking Holstein Frisians to be part of the company. And I did, uh, uh, have a, 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 I'm saying this quickly, and I've said it before many times, so it's a good story. Uh, I had a, a, from, uh, Ellen Lovell, who was then the, the head of the Vermont Council on the Arts, 50 witnesses to sit on an adjacent hillside at my family farm and witness myself with a white sheet over my head while wandering on, on an adjacent hillside in front of 50 head of Melking Holsteins. And the experience the audience would have would be this mass of black and white animals moving in zigzag patterns down a, a green background hillside and coming directly at them. And so cows, being very curious, would follow the, myself with a white sheet over my body, like a little Casper. And just before reaching their uh, object of pursuit, me, I did, dove in, disappeared into a ditch. Uh, the cows would just immediately stop and start grazing. Someone would ring a little bell, and the audience was encouraged to move on to the next uh, uh, section. I think I was, a, I was doing a, a dance on one leg on a tree stump, you know, or we're doing some rough grouse imitation. And it was a, called the Vermont Natural Theater. It was all site-specific, done in a three-mile tour around our family farm 
where, uh, you know, where we had, uh, you know, the, the environment, uh, the animals, and uh, the time and the notion to, to create a theater called the Vermont Natural Theater, which became, you know, palabalous, more formalized. Uh, in the end of this t tour, I must say, the audience was encouraged to strip naked and swim across the family pond, uh, where towels would be provided on the other side, and warm soy bread and cider, and talk about their experience. And, you know, back rubs if you want, I don't know. Those were the days. Uh, there, it would be fun in a film to uh, reenact that. Anybody want to volunteer, you know, <laughs> to be an audience? Yes, okay. <laughs> So we have just, oh, I'm a little louder now, we have just uh, experienced a imaginative stream of consciousness journey through your creative process. All right, there it is. As a little uh, teaser for what you're gonna see unfold on stage, which is an incredible medley um, spanning the last 40 years and some new creations. And so I guess I just, the, my final question to you would just be, can you share a little bit about the newest of the work that you've created for this program? Uh, for this program, my God. Well, the, I, was, I was talking to you about the Christmas lights. The paper piece, actually, <clears throat> that ends the first half, that is a, a piece that is very much like something you'd see at the Whitney. It, it has almost no sense of it being even a dance, but a kind of like an ongoing visual uh, uh, construction in, a, in an art gallery, you know, using projections, uh, large uh, swaths of paper, very low light, and, and that's just visually quite uh, magical and metamorphic. And, and uh, that's, a, that's the latest piece on this particular program. I was saying the latest piece is something we haven't done any, we haven't taken a section of, which is Alice. And we'll wait and see what happens with that. But the latest one here is the one that ends the first half. Have, and who saw that piece? Yes. Do you know what I'm, do, do you agree with what I'm saying? <clears throat> good. And, and, good. And the Very piece good. where the object itself is forever transformed through the course of the... Well, if you're using projections uh, uh, like a paintbrush and you have changing the uh, reflecting surface through movement, doing it musically, it's quite an interesting effect to see a sculpture that's just like a, something you'd see Picasso making and as the dancer is just moving the paper through the projection, uh, the image is changing rapidly. So it's not like they're moving that fast, but there's a rapid change in imagery that can excite the brain and make it feel like a, like movement. Like, and that's what it is, choreography that can get you to move, get you to watch movement and feel yourself moving without getting vertigo necessarily, now, I, which I suffer from, so I know. No. Oh. Okay. Thank you for the ideas, uh, for the inventiveness, for tonight's performance. Okay, enjoy it. Yes, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, and thank you all for coming on this, e on this cold evening. And with all the challenges of the moment, it's really wonderful to be together and um, safely together. And we appreciate you being here. Enjoy the show. Yes, yes, yes. It's lots of fun. Thank you. Thank you.